Hello, and welcome to Who Knew, a Doctor Who podcast. I'm your host, Josh Carr, and it's a little bit of a different intro this week. It's just me, on my own. Um, because, I mean, one reason is that, that there was an, a slight issue with the audio, um, unfortunately, with, with this week's episode. It's a little bit crackly throughout, but hopefully... The content will make up for it, because this week, it's the finale of season one, so I've brought you, um, I mean, it it barely gets bigger than this, because it's Katie Manning, and what an experience it was to chat to her, and I hope you all enjoy what's to come, because it was so much fun, she's exactly how you'd expect her to be. But before we did that, I just wanted to say a very quick thank you to everybody out there who's listening, because, like I said, we're at the end of Series 1. It's been an absolute joy to do this, and I've made so many friends along the way. Um, God, that's cheesy. But anyway, it's been so fun, and... I just want to say thank you to everybody who's appeared as a guest um, and everybody who's listened and downloaded and subscribed and retweeted and liked and all of that, all of that. I just want to say thank you to everybody and I want to say thank you to my girlfriend as well because she's the one who puts up with my midnight breakdowns um, when, you know, Garage Band decides not to play ball. So... Just a massive thank you. I hope you've enjoyed Series 1. It's been such a pleasure bringing it to you. And Series 2 is just around the corner. It's not going to be too long. And I really hope you enjoy it. But without further ado, here is me chatting to... I can't believe I'm saying these words. Katie Manning. how I start these podcasts is because a lot of the time I speak to fans and it's about how did you start watching the show and how did you get into it obviously your experience is a little bit different to to everybody else's that I've had on so far um so what I wanted to ask obviously you you were part of the show you're in the show during the 70s uh, as the fantastic Joe Grant um before you joined the show Obviously, the show had been on for around about seven, six, seven years or so uh, at that point. What were your preconceptions of, of Doctor Who before joining? Were, were you, I imagine you were aware of the show, but what, what were your thoughts on it before you joined? Well, I didn't have any preconceptions um, because mm. I, I'm not somebody who kind of goes down that path. However, yeah. I had only watched it with Pat. Uh, with uh, William Hartnell, that's when I first saw it. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people who've been in the show, um, I, I I watched a, a little bit of uh, Pat Troughton too, um, mm-hmm. but you know I'd already started working as an actress, and so I had no real idea. Um, mm-hmm. I but I do remember when I first watched it, I thought, like as I say, a lot of people who've been inspired to write and to to act and produce, and we know so many, you know, huge names now that will mm-hmm. all say, you know, Rob Shearman was saying the other day, you know, it's what inspired him to become a writer. We know Russell T. Yeah. Davis and Margaret and so many. So that's one of the great sides of the show. Um, but you have to remember back then, people forget because they're so busy seeing how it is now. Back then, it was a great little show. And watching it I thought wow you know this is fantastic television and 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 I I absolutely loved it I am not a science fiction fan I have to say that to you here and now Mm -hmm. um it's something I chased I haven't missed one episode since it came back to our screens Mm -hmm. and I have ultimately watched enough of everybody because when I was living in Australia and America we weren't getting it like you were all getting it here Mm -hmm. you know 
I missed out on the huge hype and the beginning of the conventions and all the rest of it. But yeah. I remember thinking this is one of the best shows I've, I'd ever seen on TV as a, mm. as a younger manning. But when I went into it, I was already doing another television series. So I wasn't really thinking, oh, gosh, I'm going to be in Doctor Who, which mm. nowadays... After John Pertwee, um, you know, had opened the door to a much bigger audience, a much uh, wider age range. Yeah. Uh, and it became a cult. <laughs> yes, it really did. By the, yeah. by the time Tom got into it, of course, it really started to blast. So, you know, when you were in it that much time before, it isn't the same as people going into it now. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you get on the front page of the newspaper because you're the new companion, but nothing like it is now. Sorry, somebody, an email just flipped across your face. No, um, that's fine. <laughs> um, the, the, so the joys of recording remotely. I know. The joys. I, I know. <laughs> start calling you, you know. Yeah. And, um, so it was a very different feeling, but I kind of was excited because I thought, oh, I love this show. This show mm. was really cool. And having... Uh, as I was doing this other very serious kind of kitchen sink drama um, mm. prior to it, it was, a, you know, a very exciting thing to be involved with. And also because, you know, special effects and all those things as an actress, I had never worked with and they were all new yeah. and it was so exciting. Um, we didn't yeah. have computers and things. So you can imagine the amount of work that had to be done to get what we had. Yeah. So, you know, when people watch the old shows now, please do not try and say, oh, yes, but that looked a bit silly and this happened and the walls were wobbly. Of you course, know, yeah. You this remember, is... that was then and that applied to everything you watched on television. Yes, you know, you did. watched the Avengers and the walls were... And I, I remember one interview I did on, I think it was on the, it was a celebration, I can't remember whether it was 40 years or whatever it was, mm -hmm. a huge celebration to, and I had to go on this interview show, <laughs> right? And the guy said to me, that just prior to going on, it was live and it was going around the world because they just discovered we went out to 90 countries in the world. And the woman who with the PA said to me, she said, by the way, the interviewer doesn't really like Doctor Who. Boing, you're on. I thought, oh, oh Lord. What? That's an introduction, <laughs> so isn't it? Who showed this stuff and he said, oh, you know, look at the wobbly walls, et cetera. I said, interesting, isn't it? I'm here because we're celebrating 50 years or whatever it was, 40 years of Doctor Who. Um, I said, so obviously the wobbly walls haven't worried anybody. No, and, and that it's is very true. You know, yeah, really? it's more it's more <laughs> true than ever because, I, I mean, I must say, I'm obviously I'm of a certain age where the first I saw of Doctor Who was when it came back with Christopher Eccleston and then the rest came later. So um, it was actually last history. year during lockdown. You got hooked up in the history. I did. And you do. It's the and it's, to what we have now. Yeah, it's it's the fact that you can you can start a program and then have forty years to to go back through, and oh, it's it's so fun. And going back, I must say, because I watched all of Doctor, classic Doctor Who from the beginning last year um and a particular highlight was those years of you and john and all of the unit boys and, and the master it was it was just it felt like a, a real peak of the show um like well it was the really beginning of the on. master you know, yeah it was the start of you know um of being able to work with um CSO, colour separation mm -hmm. overlay, as it was yeah. known then, which they were experimenting on. It was, you know, it was the beginning of so many different things, putting uniforms, proper uniforms on unit as opposed to those safari suits with the paper <laughs> yeah. bag. Um, and also, you know, they wanted to introduce sort of somebody who, you know, was very much of this planet, young, and so, of course, I got to grow up in the show mm -hmm. and you saw the show change over the years and all these things. It was so exciting. And the teams that we worked with and the people would be working way into the night after rehearsals to to make these effects better. Barry Letts, mm. you know, fought the PC to get a higher budget to be able to work with special effects. 
You know, we borrowed a, a freeze frame machine from the sports department because they were the first department to have one. And yeah. you, you do think, if you let us borrow that, we'll give you this, you know. Yeah. And it was such a wonderful time. And also, you know, um, for me as an actress, I was surrounded by inspiring actors. John Pertwee, who he and I just clicked, boom. And mm. so did the whole team just clicked. You know, yeah. there was, we were, we were socializing together away from the program. And I think that says a lot about mm. how we got, and John and I always drove to location together every single time we ate together, you know, and that makes a team. And that's what I think shows on screen is that wonderful bond that we all had. Yeah. Um, which was why it was devastating when, you know, Roger Delgado had his accident because we were yeah. so close, such a wonderful character, um, which has gone on to this day with some extraordinary performances. I've even done audios with yeah. different masters. So Derek hasn't come out yet, you know, Missy. It's, yeah. it's so exciting. Yes. And of course, at the moment, we're in this this high of, of that era at the moment where we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of your time on the show, of, of your your first series, Roger's first series, um, and the, the dawn of that that like three, four year period um, of those grounded earth stories. And then obviously in a few yeah. weeks time. Yeah. It was, uh, can I just say about that, which I think is interesting. Yeah. From my point mm -hmm. of view. Um, by putting it on Earth, I thought, you know, it was kind of interesting because if you are on another planet, <laughs> I mean, and and you believe that there's life on another planet, the chances are it's not going to be anything like us. Mm -hmm. So you expect to see something a little strange maybe coming over the top of yeah. a hill, you know. But when you're... Um, sitting in a police car with some policemen and suddenly they rip their faces off and their autons and mm -hmm. men knocking on doors with that bills and things come on this planet. I think that's a little bit more frightening yes. um, in a sense. Yeah. That I was remember a really a, good idea. There's a famous quote from John, isn't there? Where he, he says that it's a lot more frightening to find, find a Yeti on your toilet. Um, than it is to find a yeti on a on a, on a barren planet somewhere. Um, so I think that is is key to to why it worked so wonderfully. Able to go back and and to go out again. You'd you'd had that lovely time, you know, with a lot of unit and so on on this on Earth, and then mm. to be able to take off and for Joe to have had a whole year's experience and then yeah. suddenly find herself for the first the TARDIS, which also, you know, nowadays when you watch programs and, and the new companions come in, they seem to be, because of how much we now know scientifically and how much we, you know, more we've seen of what's on the moon and blah, 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 mm -hmm. it, it isn't quite such a shock as it would be just to an ordinary, not that long out of school person. Yeah. Had never trained as a, as it often says in some of the blurb that she was, um, um, a trained spy. No, she wasn't. <laughs> she wasn't any. She never, you know, she was just lucky to get a job making tea for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so for her to find herself in this situation, it was really important to think, wait a minute, I'm not sure that I want this. Mm -hmm. And so when Joe first went in the TARDIS, wow, isn't this fabulous? All groovy. It was like, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not 100% sure about this. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah. then of course, changed and once she'd done it it was like you ain't leaving me behind <laughs> yes yes <laughs> oh, yeah no, you well <laughs> yeah well talking talking about the character of joe and and how that started so um obviously you you joined the show in john's second year and so what what was it like how did you how did the part come about and how did you what were you aware of what Joe was going to be like when you were going into the auditions? No. Was it just a case of auditioning no. to be the companion and then it just snowballed from there? It well, it started basically um by them already having shortlisted it to three out of about five or six hundred auditionees. Mm -hmm. Um, I was had not been one of them. Right, okay. 
And because Richard Franklin got very confused as well. And he kept saying to everybody, oh, well, you know, I, nobody auditioned with me. I went in really late, uh, yeah. got frightfully lost at the BBC Centre. I mean, Terence Dix was the one that told this story best. So mm. I was lost. I, I had a dreadful cough. So I'm coughing. <laughs> I can't find my way because I'm so myopic. And I don't want people to see me in my big, thick glasses. So I'm trying to get round the beat. And then walking into the room, you know, take my big, thick glasses off. And then, you know, um, I sat down and they said, well, you know, hello, Katie, rah, rah, rah. And they said, you know, we, um, we have actually shortlisted it, but we wanted to see you before we actually made a decision. Mm. Um, so anyway, I, they said, could you read from the script? So I thought they're not going to see these glasses. I'm not going to let them see these great big Coca-Cola bottles. So I went, <laughs> and I went like that and they said, ah, oh. um, and they said, could you improvise for us? Obviously, I wasn't going to be able to read from the script that they'd be able to see. So mm. I did an improvisation um, about seeing something that wasn't there and then finding out that what I saw wasn't really a devil, that it was my fur hat. And then, you know, so I did that. And uh, I wasn't told very much about the character. In fact, I wasn't told anything really, except that, you know, the bare bones of... But I had, so I had nothing to work on. I just went in and did as an actress what I figured I would do in a situation like that. You know, mm. what would I do if I suddenly saw my fur hat turn into a devil? Ah, I'll yeah. show you. So that's what I did. <laughs> anyway, the next day I got a phone call asking me if I would like to be uh, played the part of Joe Grant. I said, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> That are, is, are you sure you meant, that's I amazing. even rang my agents and said, I, 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 are, they sure, are you sure they meant me? <laughs> they didn't, oh. you know, because I still do that. My agent said, I'm the only actress she's ever mm. had on her books. says, every time I get a job, I say, are you sure? Um, um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, I went into it and on the, we do the filming first. Yeah. So I went in, I met. I'd met John because he had a little lunch party at his house. So I'd, we'd already kind of realized that we got on really well, mm -hmm. uh, but I hadn't met everybody else. And so I turned up and I'm meeting, you know, the beautiful Nick Courtney and Roger Delgado and, you know, Richard Franklin, who was also new on the show too. Um, yeah. and, uh, John Levine, which was going to be our little team. And of course, everybody else that was in it was one Harry Town, you know, but that was later because that was studio. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really know. Um, they put me in this costume, which was sort of, you know, kind of ordinary and leather jerky. And I just kind mm -hmm. of went with it. Um, I'd learned my lines and probably everybody else's as well, because I was so nervous. Yeah. <laughs> and, I just went with the flow and, you know, took what I was given in the script. And and they'd asked me also to wear all my rings, which I actually, those were mine. Mm. They decided that that was going to be a character thing. Mm. Uh, I went into it. And of course, back then we were taught, uh, you know, instead of having, I didn't have anybody to do the, do the stunts for me. Like I had to, jump out of a, a very slow moving car um yes and do a tuck mm -hmm. roll and they taught me how to do that on the spot um the third time I did it yeah I really hurt myself I pulled all the ligaments in my foot I had to go to hospital Oof. um and yeah. they told me, and one naughty boy told me he was going to recast me and I was in tears and John was so cross <gasps> because he could see you know, you, they said, oh, well, you've only done a minute on film, so we can recast. And you can imagine, I mean, I was absolutely bereft, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, so John came to my came to my aid and said, no, he's teasing yes. you, darling. You'll have to get used to all of that. <laughs> uh, and the wonderful Havoc boys, who was so incredible to work with, and learning to do things I'd never done before. It was just so exciting. And, of course, my glasses had to come off every time we did a take. So when people mm. take back and they say, oh, do you remember that location? No, because I probably didn't see it. <laughs> you know, yes. I, I'm just running around all over the place. And John learned very quickly that it wasn't a bad idea to hold my hand a lot of the time. He said, yeah. 
we don't, she'll be over that cliff in a minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing to hear because it, it sounds obviously that, you know, for, for such an amazing product to come out of it, obviously because of the, the, the time and the nature of it and obviously everything that you've just said there, a lot of it is on the day, <laughs> just sort of playing around with the well, role and filming but you know characters who'd been in it for a while like John they'd already established mm-hmm. who they were yeah um, and I knew that you know Joe was so she was lovely because she was cheeky she was brave um mm. you know once the master had hypnotized her once that was it he never never got her again in any episode for anything yeah. and in fact they became kind of interesting sort of foes like you know they she banned I... Him. Yes, and I love that. Yeah, I've I've know, always loved the lovely. the relationship between Joe and the Master. It's it, it's great and to Joe have that that up, direct. And, um, and I was learning as an actress because this was only my I'd done a tiny part in Softly Softly, then I'd done two full episodes of Man at the Top. So this was my third job, and I was learning so much from so many and of course John about you know just about life and acting and all his experiences and then being able to go into all the technical side I got so close friends with with so many costume designers I was allowed to go and watch them working with all the special effects and you know into the editing suites you know I had free range at the BBC I could go anywhere and people welcomed you and taught you things and helped you through things. Mm. It was wonderful. Really, really yeah. wonderful. Well, that's as, as a fan, it's, it's lovely, lovely to hear that. Um, and obviously, as, as we've said, so that, that time on the show, it really was like, it, it was sort of the first time it became quite an oh, ensemble sorry. piece. <laughs> Just a bit of fluff in your mouth. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd been out in the snow, honey. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I keep, forget, keep forgetting that it's snowing. I am freezing cold in this house. Um, oh, I love it. I love it as well. It's love great, it. isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a, I mean, you're probably looking right back to the start of the show with William Hartnell and William Russell and... Um, oh, all of those guys oh, in terms of I the, love like, with him. I what, told him Russell? when I first met him um, through conventions and we got on so well. He's such a lovely man. And I said to him, you know, I, 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 I've never been a person who has been starstruck because I grew up mm. with a lot of people around me of oh, that. Yeah. Who were bigger stars than I'll ever be. Um, yeah. So I've never, but I remember watching him as Ivanhoe wasn't it mm. yeah yeah and I I remember sitting there and I was a very young Manning and I remember sitting there watching him and thinking I, I was just so in love with him you know mm. I was gawky little he was a cracking looking fellow wasn't he oh, he was a cracking looking fellow yeah such a lovely man, man. and a and wife oh gorgeous yeah not bad on the eyes either, was he? Back in back Easy in those days, yeah. In his nights. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you're going back to those days, back in the early '60s, from in terms of the show being a, a real ensemble piece. But I think when you say like a, a Doctor Who on ensemble, my mind automatically goes to those years with you and John, and um, obviously the amazing Chris Courtney and. Um, all of these legends of the show, um, of which you are one. And, um, I mean, obviously you, you've touched on it there there a little bit, but um, obviously you mentioned that you were all friends outside of the show as well. Um, so what, what was it like being able to go to work every day and work with all of these fantastic people and just create this, this fun programme? Well, we took the programme very seriously. One thing you have to know about Doctor Who, well, two of the things that I think people often forget, and I'm sure it works differently for other actors. Our team played hugely together. Um, Mm. You know, we'd go to dinner with Roger Delgado and Kismet and 
then we go to the Pertwees for dinner and, you know, my parents took the Pertwees out to, you know, big sporting do's and things like that. So there was this whole, yeah. and, you know, if any of us had um, a problem of any kind, we always were able to communicate this. Um, it worked as a team too from Terence Dix and from Barry Letts that, you know, anything that needed to be looked at, we all worked on it together. Mm -hmm. There was no, you know, it was team, team, team. Um, so to have that social life and to be able to go to work every day with these incredible people mm -hmm. um, and to enjoy it. But when you were working, when you were in that studio, it's a very serious business. We did not yeah. mess around. We did not lark around. And was very much, he'd never played, he'd done all this kind of comedy in his life. He'd never done what we call a, you know, I hate the word straight role, but you know yeah, what I no, mean. I, I understand what you mean, yeah. Um, and because he'd been so much in light entertainment, I still hear him on Radio 4 Extra. I listen to the Navy Lark and all sorts yeah. of things. Um, and I'd heard all that as a child. I mean, I didn't really know who he was, but boy, I knew those voices. Mm -hmm. um, and he, it was very important to him. If you're going to do a program like this, you've got to take this so seriously because you are dealing with situations that, you know, and also very early special effects had to take precedence to your acting. So yeah. you better be prepared because John taught me the only way that I was going to do a retake if I wasn't happy was to drop a naughty swear word. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know it was, it was it's vital because you're doing something that could suspend belief so you can't ever do it tongue-in-cheek you mm. can't ever send it up and neither must the scripts in yeah. my opinion um i think it really has to be as it is like you know when russell t brought it back and so on absolutely solid that mm felt this reality you felt this truth you can't yeah. fiddle fart around and do it all with a wink and a you know and think this is for real yeah. and also Terence Dix and Barry Letts were as hard as they could possibly be on science facts because mm -hmm. people are going you know and we also had a much younger audience then so you also had to have someone like me to say what, what does that mean yeah, because you, you and then you bring in that educational factor you from back in the 60s. This show should never lose the audience that it started with, which mm. is the audience. Um, and they've got older and older and older. And, you you know, now I'm into so many generations. You know, I've got grandfathers, <laughs> great-grandfathers, and I've got tiny little kiddies. Mm. You know, as, but you must always remember that they're watching too. They need to understand. And when there are scientific things, it's quite nice if you have somebody who says, sorry, didn't quite follow that. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. um, and especially back then when there was still very much largely young audience that you had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was really important to us all. And so our studio days, we got a bit naughty sometimes in rehearsals. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, there were there were quite a lot of times when and there was a great deal of laughter and um lots of little you know because you could do that then but the moment yeah. we had like a producer's run well no actually we were naughty once because we forgot there was a producer's run and we took all the props and we built a pretend airplane and john put on my glasses and this and i had this boac bag and the producer barry letts and terence stick came in and we he said uh what and we were all <laughs> every prop had built this pretend airplane and you know and the actors that were invited to to be on the show oh god they were all so wonderful yeah every single one i i don't remember do you know i don't remember anything ever unpleasant or anybody unpleasant i have nothing but absolute joyous memories every day i'd come out of my flat john would be there and we'd either go to rehearsals on the motorbike mm -hmm. 
um, or he would be there in the car. Um, if John Levine was in it, he would be picked up with us too. Yeah. But John and I mostly on our own. We go to rehearsals. He picked me up every day, and it was such fun when he bought the motorbike and I was the pillion, and we'd have burn ups with other actors on the way to the Acton Hill. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was living the life, honey. Um, yeah, I can, I can imagine being a being a young fan, like just seeing John Pertwee, <laughs> just seeing the Doctor and Joe Grant on a motorbike I on mean, your way to school in the morning <laughs> would be incredible. And, oh, that's and, that's lovely to hear, though. That, and, as you know, a fan, being able it's to have fun amazing. with everybody every day, and of course, everybody knew John. So all these very famous TV stars would come join us, and it was amazing. Then you go up to the bar, and me being a young lady who had been out with a few quite well-known people um, <laughs> in the music world, um, then you go up there, and there were all these lovely, you know, like T Rex and all these amazing and. and and um, uh, I'm going, uh, um, David Bowie, all those sort of people. I mean, everybody. Oh, wow. Because I was able to just wander in and out of the bar whenever I felt like it. We'd all go afterwards. Um, and it was so exciting and such a wonderful time. And I, you know, I, I didn't realize it because, you know, because I'd lived this other life. Um, which was so full of extremely famous people. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a person who went up and felt, I just enjoyed every moment of my life. Yeah. And everybody I was meeting, it was perfectly normal to me to be meeting those people. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, I because nowadays we're much more sort of starstruck than we were back then. Back then, you yeah. know, and especially if you'd had it all your life from childhood yes i can imagine you know, yeah that it, it changes the way that you see it you would with this and you knew the, and they were and i said yeah they were just in my life as people in your life are mm -hmm. you know they just happen to be famous but that's not what you as a friend of theirs you you can only be friends with people like that if you're not starstruck mm -hmm. yes <laughs> see i'd be terrible i'd be terrible it. I'd be walking friend. around oh, wide God, eyed. I love and... you. Oh, I love you. I want you to know. <laughs> you just yeah. do it. And it was wonderful. And the amount that I didn't realize that I was learning mm -hmm. and the amount of experiences that I had that I was just having in the moment. And now I'm being, you know, asked about it because of Doctor Who. I just, all I can say is just enormous happiness and every day we would and even when you know john wasn't well or i wasn't well we we took care of each other we got yeah. each other through some very difficult studio days with john with a migraine or a bad back or me with a migraine. we just got each other through mm -hmm. well that is it's uh, as a fan that's exactly what i would have wanted to hear from that <laughs> from that which is <laughs> is lovely <laughs> um, yeah, yeah <laughs> don't need to come on i hated them all um no that's that's lovely Um, so just in terms of like the the day to day working on the show, because obviously I my my only experiences, as I keep saying, are are from a fan's perspective, where I know the names of every story that's ever existed, and oh, I can name all you know, of the all you of the all episodes. Are, like when people said somebody said to me the other day, if you could do an interview about um, episode four of blah blah, I went. I haven't seen it since I did it. I don't watch them sit there. Yeah, here that's, and watch that's it. what my question is going to you be. Know, I, mean, I, I must be honest, I don't even watch the new Who again. Once I've seen it, I know what's mm. going to happen. Yeah. I'm not very good at watching things twice, you know, because much as I'm a massive fan of Who, I'm not a fan that says, right, now on page 900, you know, no. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's, a, it's, 
it's it's really hard because I want, you know, fans want that hardcore information and some actors are very good, they have it. Do I look like a woman that's, I don't even remember what year it is. <laughs> You know, people say to me, oh, you were in it 40 years ago. I don't know what, I'm sitting here counting the years. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, I've got a few other things going on. That's um, exactly what I was expecting. That's what I was going to say. So it's, I, it's sorry, like, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, but you know, I really what's your favourite episode part. you're in and, and things like that, because I know I that it must part. be hard. I stories. I remember mm-hmm. all of the aspects of being on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I will say about fans, and it's something I've been saying a lot recently, because it hit me not that long ago, that I've always wanted to, you know, like help as many people in the world as I can. And many, many years ago, before I did Doctor Who, and, and certainly once I was in it, I was putting little tiny charities together, taking, you know, children with difficult lives to the theatre and, you know, doing, I was with the Variety Club for a long, Mm -hmm. long time, working, putting on shows with with various children with different disabilities. And it came to me through Doctor Who, because I'm the hugger, I'm the one that, I won't just sign your photo, I want your life story and a hug. (laughs) So, and I, go without lunch I won't even go to the loo I want to hear because for me I have such respect for the fans and we also have to remember if it wasn't for the fans it wouldn't be a show Um, they are very important and we should treat them accordingly Um, Mm -hmm. and you know it's not about us it's about the program and um, so I have learnt so many people that we talked about how people were inspired to do Doctor Who uh, to go on to write, having watched Doctor Who as children. Yeah. However, what I've also learned, apart from it being a show that has inspired people to do things, it's also a show that has got people through the most traumatic and difficult times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realised that this has been the greatest gift that Doctor Who gave me, is the fact that, you know, I mean, the other day I... I, I somebody who is in um, a hospice, palliative care, had said Mm -hmm. to the staff that he always had this, you know, fondness for Joe Grant. And so so I made a video for him. Um, I'm just doing something for someone else. I do it all the time, whether it's a birthday or a marriage, or I have people who DM me with problems that they are dealing with, and I try and help them through. And I realized when people say to me, what's the best thing that Doctor Who has ever done for you? It's got nothing to do with my career. It's got nothing to do with acting. The greatest thing that I've got from Doctor Who, and I mean this absolutely from every ounce of my heart, has been the ability to help people who had or are having very difficult times because there's such a huge audience for it. And that has been for me the most wonderful thing. I absolutely adore Door, the fans that always comes across um sorry you were just on the floor then oh no it's okay that's fine back up now. i'm back i'm back up i'm back up um i love it i go through that very dramatic speech and then i drop you on the floor <laughs> that's the kind of woman um, i am that. yes that is well truly the it's woman I am. it's it's so typically joe grant of you to to have this beautiful speech and then and then drop me on the floor and that's that's wonderful um but yeah that that comes across um with with you more than more than anyone else I've, I've seen who works in the show um so from the fans I'd like to say thank you for that um so just um because we've got a lot of listeners who were very very excited about you coming on um when i announced it it went absolutely mental and i had i thought thought, hello josh has got a lot of friends yes yeah well the the (laughs) podcast is relatively new like this is the end of series one we're at now um but this is this went mental (laughs) um yes go yeah go me um so we've got we've had so many questions i think nearly like Probably close to 100 questions came in 
um, in, in different oh, formats. Oh, there were some good so, ones. There were some very good ones. So I'm very sorry if I haven't been able to include your question, but oh, I have got a good a couple, stack. Um, Oh, there was some really, really honestly, and I, I thought I'll remember those because I tweeted and said, yes, I'll remember that because that was a great question. I'm so sorry. My brain is completely gone. And I, yeah. I to remember there were some really interesting questions that I've never well, ever. That's fine. I've got I've got quite a few written down so we can we can run through a few. Let's do a so quick. That, yes, it's we can we can run through a few. Um, so it's time for the part of the show. We take a dip. Um, into the questions on Twitter, which is fondly known here as Bloody Twitter. For God's sake! Bloody Twitter! <laughs> so, so, question number one is from Sir Matt of Tardis at me likey Doctor Who uh, on Twitter. Uh, he said, my question for Katie is, what was it like coming back to do an episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures, which is his favourite episode? Uh, and what was it like working with Liz Slade and, and Matt Smith, um, well, obviously 40 years after you were on the show? I'll give you a very, as, as quick an answer as I can. I mean, there's a, that's like four questions, however. Yes, it I'll is. Do, I'll, I'll, I'll try and edit quickly. Matt Smith, absolutely the, a beautiful young actor. Um, funny, wacky. Um, the most, a very, very generous actor. Um, when asked about me, he said, oh, she's as mad as a box of frogs. And I looked at him and I said, have you ever worked with yourself? Because he is, <laughs> you know, um, he is absolutely divine. And uh, I said to him, John Pertwee would be very proud of you because you're a marvellous young actor. Yeah. Liz, I had known and we had become friends. So it was an absolute delight because we had a lot of things that I won't talk about that we had that we could talk about mm -hmm. um and then uh so to be with liz was an absolute joy and i always you know i always used to, when when she passed i i described her as the quintessential doctor who girl because she kept that character her whole life mm -hmm. she was wonderful um and they're very good together because liz said to me she said it's so great having joe's character on the show because my character is a little bit heavy sometimes she's quite serious whereas joe comes in and she said suddenly i felt uplifted you yeah because comes this kind of airy fairy wacky wonderful woman thank you russell t davis what a perfect way he'd written it um yeah and uh, to, but coming back, I said to Liz, I am absolutely, I'm trying to think of another word that isn't rude, cacking it. No, it doesn't sound right. I'm really You can, you can use a, a rude word. That doesn't bother me. Rude well, words I, are welcome on this podcast. <laughs> yes. Anyway, I was bricking it. Um, yeah. Because I thought, well, 40 years later, right, I mean, in comes the old Granny Joe. You know, with like 13 grandchildren, seven kids, Granny Jo, who's chained herself to Robert Mugabe. You know, she's still <laughs> trying to save this planet. She's upside down in teacher. You know, she's absolutely the wackiest, wonderful woman. Um, mm -hmm. Great mom she would have been. Didn't yes. let her kids go to school much as they wanted to because she said, no, no, you don't need school. I'm going to teach you about the world. Just <laughs> drop them at the bottom of a mountain and name them after the town. I mean, I just love yeah. this. Yes. Um, but I was so nervous because I thought, well, I'm old now. Um, I'm even older now. Um, I'm old now. And I said to Liz, you know, they're, they're going to expect this woman on a walking frame to come back in. Um, and they're going to be sorely disappointed that this isn't this cute little Joe, that this is Granny Joe coming back. But Granny Joe turned out to be kind of cool and groovy, didn't she? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, Almost yeah. uh, came across as the youngest person in the script, if anything. The youngest well, person Liz, in the episode uh, Liz was and Jo. I, I have to tell you, we, I mean, I knew she wasn't well, so obviously that was, but when we yeah. fell into that coffin, all I can tell you is Russell T. Davis said, I wish I could have shown them what really happened there. <laughs> I mean, we had tears of laughter running because I yeah. felt straight on top of her. Oh, Lord. We were well, nose, nose with tears running down our face. Oh, that's well, it's, it's, it's yeah, great that, that, that you really enjoyed it. Um, and similar, similarly, Cal at generic underscore tweeting asked, if you were asked to return again um, to the main show, because obviously I know you're, you're still 
playing Joe, obviously in these wonderful trailers for the Blu-ray box sets. Oh, but also on audio, you know. And I mean, the I'm audios quite... as well, yeah. So it's if, if granny, ask... gro granny Groove as Granny the... Groove. That's I what like the that. kids on the show call me was Granny Groove. <laughs> yes, I like that. Um, but yeah, if you were asked to return to to the the, sh the main show again, would you consider it? Would you? Would you? Oh well, of back? course. You know, I mean, I think I've done my many returns, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, one is never going to say never. I mean, you know, I think she is a character that still has legs for an episode. Hundred percent. You know, yeah. um, because she brings a completely different breath into it. Plus, she would be, you know, she is of th this planet, so she, and, and she's also been working to save this planet, which is what she learned from the Doctor. You know, yeah. as I said in the new Blu-ray one with my darling Stuart, and the fact she's still with Stuart is divine. I mean, yes. with Cliff. Um, but, you know, when he says something about he'd phoned unit and Joe turns around and said, I learned from the Doctor, science, not guns. Yes. You know, and that Joe, just sums up the show. And I think... You know, Joe is Joe is still kind of cool, but I think it's uh, I think I'm about as likely to win. Um, what what do they call those things that you buy tickets lottery? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm as likely to win the lottery as I think to be us back. You know. Well, I I hope that isn't the case. I think we'd all love to see you back. Um, yeah, you in some way, writing to the BBC and say we want an episode with Granny Groove. Yes, Granny and her Groove. thirty grandchildren. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag bring back Granny Groove. That's what we want. Um, Luke Malloy, a friend of the show, who is at Luke Mull one five five two four six three one. Thanks for picking an easy username. That's there, a Luke. one. Yeah, it rolls off the tongue. Um, he's asked a wonderful question. Um, which really made me laugh because he said, uh, did you, John, uh, Nicholas Courtney, John Levine and Richard Franklin all ever go for drinks together? And if so, what did everybody drink? Well, I've, uh, I've kind of answered that. You've answered that, yeah. So um, what, what would be your drink of choice? Well, I don't drink. You don't drink? Okay. No, darling, listen, you imagine with me like I am. Are you kidding? <laughs> I've been, a kid. I've crawled across stages. I have done things that people say, oh, you, I remember in America, somebody said to me, I'd been on stage and I crawled across the stage. I, I, you mm -hmm. know, I, I just do stuff. It's the child in me. I, I forget people are watching. Yeah. Um, and um, and they were saying, oh, Katie, you were so funny. You know, you must have had a drink. But I said, honey, I don't drink. And they said, <laughs> you so mean. did unless you were drunk. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, wonderful. What I lo what I loved about that question is that Luke didn't include Roger Delgado because he probably had his fan head on and he couldn't imagine you all having a drink with the master. Well, we did. Of course, you did. Roger, um, well, of course, we know Nick Courtney would either would like a couple of pints and then he'd have a glass of red or mm -hmm. twelve. Um, uh, also, you know. Um, Roger Delgado liked his uh, glasses of wine, he, you know, and the odd cheroot. Um, you know, we weren't, we just, you know, I know it's different nowadays, kids. Yes. You know. Um, uh, yeah, you weren't John all going was, out and necking WK, WKDs and, and oh, Jägermeisters. John and I share a cigarette, come on. <laughs> you know, get a grip, everybody, who goes, oh, yes. you couldn't have, yes, we did. Um and I'm still here, and he lived to a very ripe old age, so we weren't <laughs> over -aging. You know, it was the 70s, kiddo, think. Um, anyway, uh, now, uh, uh, Richard Franklin is sort of a G&T, as you can imagine, darlings, can't oh, you? Oh, yes. You know, the yeah. slice of lemon. Um, John Levine wasn't a great drinker either, you no. know. Um, probably, a, you know, a glass of wine or something. Um, you know, but we were kind of, it wasn't about that. It was, you know, dinner parties, everybody was some champagne yeah. or some wine. You know, I come from a family of parties. Yes. So watched a lot of people drinking and having the best time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, of course we did. But those were the drinks I remember. Yes. Um, well, our next question 
um, very quickly from Stuart Bint, who is at author SJB. I know uh, who Stuart Bint is. Stuart hello. Bint is a lovely fella. He's yes, a lovely, he lovely fella. Well, yes. they're all lovely, but Stuart's name, I went, yes, know who he is. Yes, Stuart, I had to put in here. So he's asked, when you were in the show, did you, in your wildest dreams, think it would still be running all of these years later? Oh, good God, no. I mean, I, I can say this because John actually said it in public. Um, mm -hmm. John said, you know, after Tom leaves, that'll be the end of who? Mm. Um, you know, we had no idea. You didn't even think like that. Yeah. Well, you, that's it, the thing. The things that, you, you see, know, shows that you've never had a show now. like that before. Um but it's not even just that, it's the fact that it's it's still running all these years later and you're still involved. And it's like you're <laughs> which is which is incredible. Um I mean, who thought I'd ever end up with my granddaughter? Um they brought out three figurines. There's a new set out, which I probably shouldn't say it, but I think it's a little odd. Um <laughs> but the the other ones that they brought out <laughs> and my you know, the fact that my granddaughter is running around and takes this little character which was the very first one I did was The Three Doctors. They brought out two others since. Yeah. But she got The Three Doctors one with the coat that comes off. I was the first one to have removable clothing. Please don't take <laughs> that the wrong way. I insisted, too, that they painted knickers on underneath because the first one I saw, I lifted the skirt. And I said, Joe's got no knickers on. <laughs> and all the others now <laughs> have got knickers. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Um, but my my granddaughter, you know, takes this little and, you know, I put it up on Twitter a few times. You know, there's her and she's, Georgie says, who's it? She said, oh, it's grandma. She's got grandma. She's holding the figurine. And she where's grandma? She said, oh, grandma's taking her pet chicken for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> um, she, and they and grandma goes out to dinner. Grandma even wore a face mask out to dinner in, in Australia. It's not here. Um, and then she decided grandma's skirt was too short. So she wrapped toilet roll around my legs. <laughs> I mean, now, I honestly never imagined that happening in my life. I also never imagined being on a stamp with the Queen's head smaller than mine. <laughs> yes. I'm yeah, that did happen. Yeah. Too. Well, um, well, that is, yeah, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> um, our final question um, comes from Ivy, at protagonist Ivy. Um, this is one that I wanted to include. Um, just uh, to, to close close out the show yeah. um, and close off the series. So she said, Katie, how do you maintain such wonderful positivity every single day? And she also wanted to thank you for spreading that positivity to us all, because I, I think I'm not the only person, this is from me, I'm not the only person who your videos on Twitter saying hello and just spreading that joy Lot, especially in this this past year that we've had it's really kept me going and I think it's kept a lot of people going as well so uh, I mean again thank you from from on behalf of all of us all of us I fans really, you know I it's so easy in this world because as I say quite often bad news shouts the loudest mm -hmm. you you switch on the television. They're not going to tell you about the beautiful pussycat that was just rescued from the tree this morning like they used to on the news. Yeah. It's now um, everything. You look on social media and there is, yes, there's a lot of positivity, but there is a huge amount of darkness, whinging, moaning, you know. Um, and I believe very much so that People need some joy and some uplift in their life. And the fact that there is always possibility. You know, mm. if, if you want to look down all your life, you will only see darkness. You've got to look up and it's always there. There's always huge possibility. There's always hope. You know, we've been on this planet for millions of years. We ain't going anywhere yet. We <laughs> might lose a lot along the way, but honey, we ain't going anywhere. And I believe that, you know, in this life, we should all be more respectful, more caring and have more compassion and understanding and less judgmentalness towards each other, you mm -hmm. know. And I look out there and I see on Twitter and all around me, you know, wonderful people. And I just want everybody to at least get one smile a day. It's yeah. just under our noses. 
and it's very easy to locate. Yes. Um, and, you know, I truly, I feel a bit teary saying this, but I truly love everybody on my Twitter. And as I said one day, you know, why can't I tell people I love them? People can not know somebody and hate them. Well, I don't mm -hmm. have to know you personally to know that I love you. Oh, well, that yeah. is that is a beautiful sentiment. And I, I, again, we we all feel the exact same towards you. And uh, one one thing I wanted to to cover, we have this um, that we have a couple of little segments, regular segments that we do on the show, which is the DVD collection where our guests submit a story, uh, like a Doctor Who episode that they've loved, and people submit a person to the corridor of fame, which is like a hall of fame of Doctor Who. I'm. I I wanted, if it's okay with yourself, because I know that it would be hard for you to pick, you know, one person after you've worked with all of these amazing people and to pick one story. So if it's okay with you for the final episode of the series, I would like to take the reins and for the DVD collection, I would like to submit your first story, Terror of the Autons. And for the Corridor of Fame, I would like to submit you Katie Manning, to be in the Corridor of Fame, to join people like Elizabeth Sladen and, and Russ T Davies and John Barrowman, these legends of the show, because I think you deserve to be there because of that, because of the positivity that you spread and because of how amazing you were in the show and how amazing you've, you've been to the fans over the years. So um, I hope um, you don't mind. One thing though, if you're going to shove me in the Corridor, yes. all the all these fabulous people will you remember to bring me the odd cannoli of course I'll, I, <laughs> cannolis are always provided at the end of the corridor of the fame we we have we have the canteen of fame and <laughs> cannolis will be served in the canteen um so we so much that's so sweet and i well yes, you deserve it of autons yes terror of the autons is a is a wonderful wonderful episode um I so we're we're gonna we're gonna round it off there. It's the end of the series. Yes, and I can't hold my phone much longer. My uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> again, the joys <laughs> of lockdown recording. Um I have one final question which I ask all of my guests. So to close off series one, obviously it's very hard to contain it in a sentence, so you can have free reign if you like, but in a sentence, what does Doctor Who mean to you? I think I answered that when yeah. I said Doctor Who has given me the opportunity to not only find some extraordinary friends um, through the show, um, but more than anything, it's shown me how many wonderful people in this world that there are that I would never have met. And that's basically the fans around the world um, mm -hmm. that have brought so much joy and given me such an opportunity to try and help um, as many people as I can if they need help or just to hug somebody. You know, when somebody turns around, um, sorry, my mouth is getting so dry here. Um, no, fine. Somebody, <laughs> have I got cannoli around my mouth? I have, haven't no, I? No, you don't. I don't think you do. <laughs> I can't I'm in the see middle anything. of this a dramatic moment. I suddenly think, well, no, I've got cannoli around my mouth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's that sort of situation when somebody looks at you and you're hugging them and they said, I've never been hugged in my life. Um, and then, you know, all of the stories that I have to tell of different things that have happened and that one's been able to make just a little bit of difference for. You know, um, and Doctor Who gave me this worldwide ability to communicate with some of the most extraordinary people, brave. Um, it, it's so amazing to me what so many people have come through. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what Doctor Who's given me. People like you, sweetheart. Oh. You know, like everybody, it's it's just a pure joy to have been part of and to still be part of and still meeting extraordinary brave wonderful people yes yes well that that is a moment 
that is a moment for me in my life. And this this whole episode has been absolutely wonderful. You have been a joy to speak to. You too. And You've done a great job. I mean, thank you very much. Easy. You know, my children will attest to that. Yes. It's, imagine her as your mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well you've been wonderful josh and you've done a great job because i have spoken to you know but you actually are a man that knows what he's doing well done really thank you i wouldn't thank have said this long if you hadn't i would have um scarfed I, I would have escaped yes well i'm glad that you didn't because it's been <laughs> wonderful all the people that sent in questions and maybe we'll do it again another day and we'll answer some of those that I... I would love to. You are welcome back on whenever you like. Take so, care, my sweetheart. And thank if anybody you. Take ever care. Me, should they go with on and talk to Josh, I'm going to tell them absolutely yes. Oh, that is... That, that is a seal of approval. You got it, honey. <laughs> yes. Well, you've all been listening to Who Knew, a Doctor Who podcast... The end of series one. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Mwah. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Mwah. Josh. Have a bye lovely bye. new day. I'm back you to too. my cannoli. Bye back bye, to your Dad. cannoli. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Who Knew, a Doctor Who podcast. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts for new episodes every week. And if you can leave us a review, it would really help us out. And a big thank you to the Sononauts for providing cover of the Doctor Who theme as the theme tune for the podcast. Thank you.